My name is Sam Vaknin, and I am the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisible. Our natural tendency is to trust, because as infants we trust our parents. It feels good to really trust. It is also an essential component of, of love, and an important test thereof. Love without trust is actually dependence, masquerading as love. We must trust. It is almost a biological urge. Most of the time, we do trust. We trust the universe to behave according to the laws of physics. We trust soldiers to not go mad and shoot at us. We trust our nearest and dearest to not betray us. When our trust is broken, we feel as though a part of us had died and had been hollowed out. But to not trust is actually abnormal. It is the outcome of bitter or even traumatic life experiences. Mistrust or distrust are induced not by our own thoughts or some device or, or machination of ours. They are induced by life's sad circumstances. To continue to not trust is to reward the people who had wronged us and rendered us distrustful in the first place. Mistrust and distrust is the perpetuation of, ab of abuse. Those people, our abusers, may have long abandoned us, and yet they still have a great malign influence on our lives. And this is the irony of being distrustful to others. While you mistrust and distrust others, you are actually perpetuating the abuse. You are actually keeping your abuser with you. Some of us prefer to not experience that sinking feeling of trust violated. Some people choose to not trust, and this way skirt disappointment. But this kind of tactic is both a fallacy and a folly. Trusting releases enormous amounts of mental energy, which is more productively vested and deployed elsewhere. But it is true that trust, like knives, can be dangerous to your health when used improperly. So you have to know how to trust. You have to know who to trust. And you have to know how to confirm the existence of a mutual, functional sort of trust. We all know that people often disappoint and are not worthy of trust. Some people act arbitrarily, capriciously, treacherously, viciously, or even offhandedly. You have to select the targets of your trust very carefully. He who has the most common interest with you, who is invested in you in the long, for the long haul, who is incapable of bridging trust, a good person, he who doesn't have much to gain from betraying you, is not likely to mislead you, not likely to breach your trust. These people you can trust. But you should not trust indiscriminately. No one is completely trustworthy in all fields of life. Most often our disappointments stem from our inability to separate one realm of life from another. A person could be, for instance, sexually loyal, but utterly dangerous when it comes to money, a gambler. A person could be a good, reliable father, but also a womanizer. You can trust someone to carry out some types of activities, but not others, because these activities are more complicated, or more boring, or do not conform to his or her values. So we, we should trust people in certain respects, in certain capacities, certain fields, and not in others. I don't mean to say that you should trust with reservations. This is not, a tr this is not trust. Trust with reservations is a kind of trust that is common among business uh, or, uh, people or criminals. Its source is rational. Game theory in mathematics deals with questions of calculated trust, an oxymoron. If we do trust, we should trust wholeheartedly, and unreservedly, but we should be discerning. Then we will be rarely disappointed. 
As opposed to, as opposed to uh, popular opinion, trust must be put to the test, lest it go stale and stale. We are all somewhat paranoid. We gradually grow suspicious, inadvertently hunt for clues or of infidelity or other forms of breach of trust. The more often we successfully test the trust we had established, the stronger our pattern-prone brain embraces it. Constantly in a precarious balance, our brain needs and devours reinforcements. Such testing should not be explicit, but circumstantial. Your husband could easily have had a mistress. Your partner could easily have robbed you, robbed you blind. And yet, they haven't. They have passed the test. They have resisted the temptation. Trust is based on the ability to foretell the future. It is not so much the act of betrayal that we react to, as it is the feeling that the very foundations of our world are crumbling, that it is no longer safe because it is no longer predictable. And here is another here lies another important lesson. Whatever the act of betrayal, with the exception of grave criminal corporeal acts, whatever the act of betrayal, it has limited hand. Naturally, we tend to exaggerate the importance of such mishaps. This exaggeration serves a double purpose. Indirectly, it aggrandizes us. If we are worthy of such unprecedented, unheard of, major betrayal, we must be worthwhile and unique. The magnitude of a betrayal reflects on us and re-establishes the fragile balance of powers between us and the universe at large. The second purpose of exaggerating the act of perfidy is simply to gain sympathy and empathy, mainly from ourselves, but also from others. Catastrophes are a dozen a dime, and in today's world it is difficult to provoke anyone to regard your personal disaster as anything exceptional. Amplifying the event has, therefore, some very utilitarian purposes. But finally, blowing things out of proportion poisons the victim's mental circuitry. Putting a breach of trust in perspective goes a long way towards the commencement of a healing process. No betrayal stamps the world re irreversibly or eliminates all, all other possibilities, opportunities, chances and people. There's no such betrayal. Time goes by. People meet and part. Lovers quarrel and make love. Dear ones live and die. It is the very essence of time that it, that it reduces all of us to the finest dust. Our only weapon, however crude, however naive, against this inexorable process is to trust each other.